Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paddy Gonigal. I'm Emeritus Professor of Business Studies at the Kemi Business School at the University of Limerick. Uh, originally from North Sligo, I'm a graduate of UCD and Cranfield School of Management. Um, I previously worked for a short time in the US and for somewhat longer in Zambia. And our guest here today is Dave Collings. Um, by way of introduction, I know that Dave is a proud Limerick man who has worked in Dublin City University for a number of years now. So Dave, I wonder if you could introduce yourself and briefly describe your time in UL and your career to date. Thanks, William Paddy. Yeah, it's a, a pleasure to be with you today and a pleasure to be part of, of Alumni Week as a, as a very proud UL graduate. Yeah, um, I got a, a good innings in my time in UL. I, I did the BBS, uh, went from the BBS into the Masters in HR and then obviously did my PhD. So I managed to hang around for the best part of, of a decade one way or another and, and really enjoyed my time in UL. Um, after UL, I went to work in the UK for a while. So my, my first academic post was at the University of Sheffield, uh, was there for a number of years, then moved back to NUI Galway, uh, where a number of roles, including the head of the management department. And then in 2012, uh, moved to DCU, and I've been in DCU since as, as professor of HR. Uh, I've also been lucky enough to have some visit visiting positions. Uh, so I was a visiting professor at King's College in London for a number of years. I spent some time in Cornell in the US as, as a Fulbright scholar and, and, and also in Nanyang Business School in Singapore. So I, I've been lucky enough to see a bit of the world uh, on the journey as well, which has been a lot of fun. Great. Thanks for that, Dave. I know that much of your recent research has focused on the future of work. Um, and I also, as, as you're well aware, I think that the whole idea of the future of work can be somewhat of a nebulous concept. So, Dave, could you clarify what you see as the meaning for us of the, of the future of work and how work has evolved over time? Yeah, that's a great question, Paddy. I think you're absolutely right. I think the term the future of work is one of those ones that's used rather loosely uh, in, in, in a lot of the popular press and the media. And I guess that was kind of what piqued my interest in it. So I've been working in this space. It's, it's probably over the last three, four years that I've really got interested in it. And I think when we look at the research on the future work, it tends to talk about three broad areas. The, the first area is the digitization of work. So that's kind of work that was traditionally done manually or intellectually uh, that's that's augmented by or completely re replaced by technology so uh, you know a, a low level example something like a chat bot so you log on to a website with a query uh, in many instances you're now interacting with technology you're interacting with artificial intelligence that picks up the keywords in your in your question and tries to come up with a response so we some low level kind of work replaced like that, but we also see technology impacting at a very high level on work. So, you know, if you look at um, uh, med medical practitioners often use technology to help them in their decision making as they analyze results. And there's some research that shows that, you know, if I re rely on technology on its own to make a decision, the decision will be um, relatively okay, if a physician on its own will be relatively okay, but actually the two coming together leads to much better decision making around uh, so, some, some areas of, of diagnosis. So we have that kind of digitization of work where work that was traditionally done by humans is, is augmented or replaced by technology. Uh, similarly by robotics. So if you look at, you know, big uh, warehouses right now, you know, a significant amount of work in those uh, our sectors and those organizations is done by, by fairly simple picking robots that go and find an item and bring it back to be packaged. We can see robotics in other sectors like, you know, uh, in terms of, of uh, cleaning, uh, whether it be clean room environments or, or even hosp hospitals and the like. So, so that broad work band of digitization is the first key one. And the second key area we see kind of in focus on the future of work is around the gig economy. And again, one of those terms that's that's ubiquitous, yeah. but but often kind of used relatively loosely. And this is really about, you know, using online platforms to allocate work um, to people. So I guess the most high profile examples are the likes of Uber, where, you know, I have an app on my phone and I get a cab to come, come collect me or, um, you know, at Deliveroo or one of the delivery services where, where you know, um, people will deliver food on behalf of food businesses and bring it to me. 
Uh, and I guess traditionally the third bucket that, that the future of work research tends to focus on was around demographics and, and looking at where work was located, but also looking at the fact that we tend to live longer now and, and we no longer have this model where, you know, somebody re retires at 65 with a relatively short life expectancy, but recognizing that many people retire at, at 65, but have, you know, quite a significant amount of time after their retirement. So we're kind of thinking about the career journey that people have in a different way and recognizing that many people go through a number of different stages in their career and have multiple careers over, over their, their working lives. So they're kind of the three broad areas that we traditionally talk about when we talk about the future work. Just related to that, Dave, just a quickie, um, is the impact on employment. I mean, the, the, the traditional fear of robotics was that robotics would replace largely mundane jobs, but yeah. sometimes more more advanced jobs. And hence, you would have you 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 would have you have all these people with limited skills with no no access to decent employment, as it were. Yeah, so 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 yeah, I, and that's a typical fear. If you go back to the 1950s, 60s, when, when ATM machines were, were introduced, we saw similar concerns about the, the banking profession and people working in banks. But what we actually saw at that time was the number of people working in banking increased because banks had lower entry costs to set up a branch because the ATM did some of the work so they could set up more branches, in fact, was what happened. Um, what, what we, you know, what the data were suggesting pre-COVID certainly were that the early automation was more likely to be in mid to high skill jobs because mm -hmm. the cost of replacement of those low skill jobs is still a little bit too high. So it was cheaper for organizations to continue to pay people for, for low skilled work. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how that has been accelerated by COVID. Uh, there are some worrying data that suggests that people who are in jobs at risk from automation, um, when they move to another job, they tend to move to jobs that are equally at risk. So it does create a, a societal challenge for us in terms of how we think about a broader skills strategy. And I know the likes of Skillnet Ireland nationally here are, are very much focused on that kind of agenda and, and Solace and other organizations as well. So, so I think you're absolutely right. I think that is a really important question at a societal level as we think about how particularly those low skill jobs become automated over time. Yeah, the, you've mentioned COVID and I'll, I'll, I'll just move to that now and just um, maybe ask you to illustrate how you feel COVID has impacted on the nature and potentially on, on the future of work? Yeah, I, I think what we see is two key things. The first is that a lot of the trends we had already been seeing have been accelerated. Uh, so if we look at, for example, the digitization of business, uh, you know, just take banking as a very easy example, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but I certainly haven't been in a bank branch in the last 12 months um, so, the, so the shift from uh, physical to online banking yeah, has been yeah, hugely yeah. accelerated. And in fact, we saw uh, Bank of Ireland refer to that in, in, in their justification for, for closing some of their branch network over the last couple of weeks. So I think we've definitely seen the digitization of business accelerated quite significantly. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we saw some initial um, you know, some of our research looks at, at learning and development, and we saw a real push in those early days of the crisis for skills that help people transition to that, digi that nature of digital work. Also, if you look at service provision, you know, look at hosp uh, hospitality, for example, we've seen a kind of a shift there as well. So, you know, some of the bigger hotel chains are, are differentiating themselves on, on the lack of human contact. So, you know, key, uh, uh, personless check-in and keyless entry and the like, where your phone becomes your card. Again, that's a trend that's been accelerated. So we've seen some trends um, that, that were already happening, accelerating. Uh, I think the second key thing we've seen is a, a renewed focus on, on place of work and the debate around working from home, um, commuting, all of those kind of things. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see over the next number of years where we land in that regard. Um, personally, I think that the hype has gone a little bit too far on the working from home um, focus. I think the reality is for most individuals, and most organizations, there still be a requirement to spend some of their time in the workplace. And in fact, even at the height of the lockdown, you know, the amount of people working from home in Ireland was, was less than 40%. It was kind of 35 to 40%. 
the vast majority, well, sorry, a majority of people still have to go to a workplace. If you work in retail, if you work in hospitality, uh, if you yeah, work construction. in construction, construction, yeah. you don't have a choice, right? Yeah. And, and even those of us that do are lucky enough to have the flexibility, we know that a lot of people reported significant uh, well-being concerns because of the lack of social interaction. And I think over the longer term, organizations are likely to be concerned about questions around you know, innovation. How do we continue to have people innovate when they're not in the same room together? So I think we've had a recalibration for that work that can be done at home. And I think certainly we're starting from a new baseline. So I think many of us that are lucky enough to be able to work from home We'll probably work a little bit more from home than we did in the past, a day or two a week even. Um, but I think for a lot of people, um, they will continue to have to go to the workplace by the nature of their work anyway. And there is the potential for intermediary hubs and, you know, yeah. uh, that, that, that option seems a, you know, a useful option for uh, to, to meet in the middle almost. As well. I, I think so, Paddy. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think, you know, in normal times when, you know, people with childcare responsibilities and their children are at school or, or, or in, in childcare, you know, that's a very different proposition to working from home than the current proposition, which, which we can also see some evidence has been very gendered. So, you know, in those homes where there are children to be cared for, we know that, that females take greater caring responsibility, mm. uh, which puts a lot of pressure uh, on, on female employees in particular. Um, and even with, you know, caring for, for elder elder um, yeah. parents yeah. and the like. Yeah. Um, and also we see we see a disproportionate impact in terms of, you know, those of us that are lucky enough to live in homes where we've dedicated office spaces or, 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 or even a spare bedroom. Um, whereas, you know, for those that are living in, in smaller accommodation that's less flexible, it's brought a lot of stress and pressure to people yeah. in different ways. So the impact of working from home has been very, very uneven. Yeah, just I think you've touched on most of these, but just uh, just to 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 finish up on this on this angle of it is is the employer perspective. How are organiz how well are organisations prepared, or how well are they dealing with uh, the trends that you've identified? Yeah, so we did a we did a big study, Paddy, uh, towards the back end of 2019, as I said, and, and one of the questions we asked was, you know, uh, how much of a priority is the future of work for your organisation? And only about four in 10 respondents said that the future of work was a priority in their organisations. And even fewer, about a third of respondents said, uh, we feel we're, we're well prepared for the future work. And one of the things we kind of argued was the re one of the reasons for that was the, the narrative of the future of work suggested this was something in the distant future and not something that needed to be a priority right now. So those organizations were so busy managing in the here and now that they didn't really have time to focus on those things. Uh, That's a bit same as it ever was a little bit. There's always been that issue of, you know, the kick it down the road uh, elements. Um, we know some of these things are coming, but they're far away, and they're you know they may not. We 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 may may get by pretty easily. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think it, there was that kind of inertia. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I think I think COVID has given a renewed focus to um, a, a focus on, and, and I think we see a lot of the narrative has shifted towards skills now and a recognition of the importance of skills. Uh, we see, you know, some data that suggests that learning and development has gained more status in organization. HR has certainly gained more status in organizations. And, and the recognition from senior organizational leaders of the importance of reskilling and upskilling. So, you know, the simple example of, you know, where in that early tr tr transition to working from home, how do I use Microsoft Teams? How do I use Zoom? Yeah. You know, that was where we saw a massive uh, emphasis very quickly. We've all, we've, we've all ticked those boxes in the last 12 months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't know how to set up a Zoom meeting this time. Last year, but, uh, I, do, I do it about 10 times a day now. So, so yeah, I think it's very mixed, but I, I think COVID has really kind of forced organizations to really take it seriously. And, and their, their reskilling agenda has become much more of a priority for organizations. And from a worker perspective, you know, how well are workers prepared or employees prepared and how, how, how much kind of are organizations doing to help prepare uh, employees um, you know, issues like um, you know, future proofing their skills, developing skills, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important question. Um, I, my sense is people uh, in general, again, probably underestimate this. And um, you know, I think we, 
we sometimes, um, again, that, that idea that this is something in the future and it will work out okay. So uh, one of the most interesting statistics I saw when we, were, when we were doing our preliminary work was we saw some research that looked at that the half-life of an engineering degree. So basically, how long does it take what you learn on an engineering degree? How long does it take half of that to become redundant? Absolutely. And 100 years ago, that was 30, 35 years. Now people talk in windows of three to five years of half of what you learn on an engineering degree you know, being outdated basically by updates to, to technology and the way things are happening. So what that really clearly suggests to us is that we can no longer think about learning as a, as a one and done thing. We go, we do our degree and we move into a career in that area. And, and I think, to be honest, that shift was happening anyway. We, we see a lot of people, you know, consider uh, further education, whether it be master's programs or the like. I think what's different now is we we'll still see people who, you know, maybe move from a technical background into a, a managerial background that might want an MBA for, for some of the, uh, the uh, networking and, and the, the, the skill sets they require. But we're seeing a shift towards more bite-sized learning, you know, like I need to set up a Zoom meeting. How do I do that? Yeah. And I can access that material much quicker, much more quickly. And you, I can YouTube do it. YouTube becomes the answer. And that's absolutely the case. You're absolutely right. Yeah, there's so much out there. You know, even some of, I, I look at some of my PhD students now and they're looking for statistical skills. They find them on YouTube. So it's, I need to solve a problem and I need to do it quickly. I don't need to go on a three-day training course. I just need that kind of learning in the flow of work. And the broader, I think the broader switch, Dave, as well, is the onus has been shifted much more to the worker. You know, there was a time when the employer would suggest, oh, we'll, you do an MBA, we'll fund you on an MBA. Now it's, it's, the onus is very much on the worker to, to develop their own skills in bite size or in bigger size. But, and also, it seems the cost has been deferred to the worker as well, that one time the employer paid for the MBA, but now you're going to a one-year development course, you, you pay for it yourself. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there's a couple of elements to it. I, I think historically people tended to come in to organizations at a relatively small number of levels. So they came in at a graduate program and worked their way up. I, and more experienced hires were a smaller part of the mix. But actually, when you look at organizations now, they're much more varied. People are coming in at lots of different levels in lots of different roles. So it's harder for an organization to have a kind of a fixed suite of courses and a logical set of steps that people follow as they build their careers. So I think that's one part of the story for sure. Um, and I think that the, the pace of change is so quick that the requirement is, is for, for people to, to adapt differently. I, in fairness, I think there are some organizations that recognize the importance of time. So we, one of the insurance organizations that, part, that, that took part in our, our uh, study were looking at developing basically learning passports for individuals. So it was not only a budget, right, in terms of if you need resources to do a course, but, but just as importantly, had an allocation of time for learning. Uh, okay. and, and that was part of it. Like if you look at an organization like Novartis, they very clearly set out that they want their employees to spend 5% of their time on learning. Um, now, obviously, when the rubber reads the road and the pressures of time come on, that creates you know, pressures on people's time. And what don't I do on my work time? I do the kind of discretionary stuff. So some organizations are really working hard to kind of red circle time, to, to have time where people yeah. learn. Yeah. Uh, and, they're really, and, and it's often at a, a team level where really innovative leaders kind of have that learning time in people's calendars and it's very hard to shift it. Okay. Okay. Um, could I just broaden the topic a little bit and just uh, just talk about advances in technology that have, as you've mentioned, brought us the gig economy, gig economy broadly defined. This also seems to have concurrently led to a regression in the work experience of many gig workers. For example, the issue with delivery drivers and, and their safety in, 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 in Dublin recently. Um, and also the gig economy has also been characterized as being associated with the widespread use of bogus subcontracting as, as a means of evading employment law protections. I'm just wondering, this is, these are very broad topics, but I'm just wondering, did your work address any of those topics and what's your, what's your sense from your research? 
Yeah, so so they, I, I think there's a lot of great questions there. It wouldn't have been core to our research, Paddy, and I think actually there, yeah. there's a lot of your colleagues in, in UL doing some great work around this, um, you know, leading the international debates, not not just the national debates. But, but I think it's absolutely, I, I, well, I, I think the, the gig economy is kind of truncated. So there's a high-end gig economy where, you know, a lot of people by choice, um, have climbed the greasy pole in organizations, have gained considerable experience and, and you know, enter the gig economy to, to have more flexibility in their work life, to do uh, work that they consider more meaningful to them. But I think at, at you know, what we might call the lower end gig economy, the, the typical one we think of, the, the drivers and, and the delivery riders, mm. I think it's absolutely the case that, that you know, that's a very challenging space. And I think a big part of the problem is that the legislation hasn't caught up with it yet. So you know, a lot of our employment legislation is written for the traditional nine yeah. to five model. Um, it's written for an assumption that there's a clear boundary between who an employee is and who an employee is not. And we've seen a real shifting of that, of those sands in terms of, of um, the gig economy. And we've seen you know, very high profile cases in Spain and in the UK just in the last couple of weeks around this. Uh, and, and our own Tanish that obviously last week met, met with, with gig workers. So I think this is kind of a case of the legislation not having caught up with the uh, innovations in, in how work is being organized. And I think you know that's certainly a really important policy agenda for, for the government in terms of thinking about how do they find that balance between you know protecting workers' rights, um, you know, the, the flexibility that the model, because, you know, some people, you know, if you're a student, there, there, there may be some positives in, in the yeah. ability to work zero hour contracts or, or, or to engage in the gig economy. So it's really trying to find that middle ground where, yeah. where workers are, are, there's a fair balance in the, in the distribution of, of the rights on both sides, I think. And to finish, Dave, I, I have a related question, um, and I'm just wondering, does your research see a role for trade unions in the future world of work? So again, Paddy, not something we would have explicitly focused on in our research, but I think it is really an important question. And actually, it was, it was very interesting to see SIP2 uh, are re representing some of the Deliveroo drivers in, in, in some of the discussions that are happening nationally at the moment. Yeah, I think absolutely. I, I think, you know, it's, it's clearly a challenge for unions in that, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to organize a group of disparate workers who aren't in a workplace, who don't meet uh, traditional uh, classifications in terms of employment because of how the legislation is, is written. Um, but I think a lot of these workers are, you know, quite often quite vulnerable positions in, in terms of um, taking on um, their terms and conditions. They, they're very reliant on the work and they, they have few other options. So, so we know that unions tend to be quite uh, important players, particularly for those types of, of workers uh, who are who are in less strong negotiating positions on an individual basis. So I think again, it's an area that unions will have to innovate. They'll have to think differently about how to how to uh, recruit these members, how to organise them. Um, obviously, we need some shifts in terms of legislation to for those unions to be able to represent them. Given currently, many of them wouldn't be classified as employees. Um, but I think, you know, as unions kind of look to reinvent themselves and look towards the future, I think it's certainly an avenue they will they will, will need to pursue too. Yeah. OK. Um, thanks very much, David. It's been a real pleasure to, to talk with you today. Um, best wishes with your future research and in your future career. Thanks, thanks again, David. I'm delighted to be part of the discussion. Really enjoyed catching up. Cheers.